What if I told you that there was an early access game that was really fun, had weekly updates, procedurally generated levels, controller support, 95% positive reviews on Steam, and it was also a strategy, roguelike, adventure, deck builder. And it was under $20. You'd probably call me a liar. Well, with early access games getting a lot of hate, you'd be right to be skeptical. Looking at you, cash-grabbing devs. However, this isn't a joke. This isn't a lie. There is a game that fits all these categories. A game with such an odd concept that it will shock- Oh, shoot. The name of the game is in the title of the video, isn't it? Well, there goes that suspense. Slay the Spire! So, in this game, you attempt to slay the spire. No duh. You do this by traveling through the three sections of the game. The first is called the Exordium, which mostly has weaker enemies, slimes and worms, stuff like that. The second area is called the city. The enemies are definitely tougher here. Man-eating plants, uh, big snake, fluffy planet, and the BFF crew. The third area is called the Beyond, and it has some of the toughest enemies in the game, such as the Dark Slime Bros, a uh, Pyramid Mouth, a uh, Metal Fish, and a Bomb. So, on to gameplay. You start at level 0 and choose your path from 1 of 4, each with different encounters along the way. There are normal enemies, elite enemies, mystery spaces, shops, treasures, fireplaces, and boss spaces. Normal enemy spaces will award you with a little bit of gold and the choice of 1 of 3 cards to add to your deck. Elite enemy spaces will also give you gold, a little bit more, a card, which is usually a bit rarer, and a relic. Treasure spaces will also give you relics. I'll talk more about relics later. Fireplaces will allow you to heal for a portion of your health or upgrade one of the cards that's in your deck, making it stronger. Finally, boss spaces. These are always the last level of an act and will have a monster that is really difficult. The path you take is entirely up to you, and you can see which spaces are which. So, do you choose the path full of mystery spaces? Or... Do you choose the one full of elites to snag all those relics? Or do you take the safe path, the one with all the fireplaces, so you can stay at full health and upgrade all your cards? It's all up to you. So moving on to the combat system, when you enter combat by either stepping on a normal enemy space, an elite enemy space, or a few question mark spaces, you draw five cards. These cards have different effects, ranging from attacks, defense, debuffing the enemy, or buffing yourself, giving yourself stat boosts, and so on. That's not all the cards do, but I'll be here all day if I list everything that the cards can do in this game. You also have an energy limit on the left side of the screen. Start, this starts at 3, but can be increased with special events and relics. Every card that you have also has a different energy cost, which is the number on the top left. This means you need to be careful about which cards you play and what order you play them in. The higher cost cards usually do a lot more, but it may not be worth it to play it this turn. Maybe the enemy is attacking you for 11, so it'd be better to block rather than use that 2 cost attack card. In combat, your goal is very simple. Get rid of the enemy's health before he gets rid of yours. That's it. However, where Slay the Spire shines is the different playstyles that you can use and succeed with. The main focus of the game is building your deck. Now, every character begins with their own starter deck, however, it's up to you to change it, either by adding cards that you think might work, or that you just think are cool, and removing cards that you don't want. Every time you defeat an enemy in combat, you get the option to pick a card and add it to your deck. Keep in mind that this is optional, not required. In my opinion, since you only draw 5 cards a turn, you should try to keep your deck under 20 cards, otherwise you won't get the cards you need when you need them. Taking a bit of a detour here to explain the cards, some of them have special effects. There are four total different card effects. Number one is unplayable. These are cards that cannot be played under normal circumstances. They're almost always curses, which are negative cards that harm you. More on those later. Two are exhaust cards. These cards can only be played once per combat, then they are removed from the deck until the end of combat. Three are ethereal cards. These cards must be played when they're in their hand. If you choose to not play them, they automatically exhaust at the end of your turn. Four are innate cards. 
Cards with this ability are automatically added to your starting hand, making your starting hand bigger than 5. Additionally, there are different types of cards as well. The types of cards you have are attack cards, they deal damage to the enemy. Some cards like Bash have secondary effects, where they will apply an effect to the opponent. Two are skill cards. These cards usually provide some, time, some type of temporary buff to your character. Block is a good example of this. You play block, you take less damage until the end of your turn. At the end of your turn, even if you still have block, it's gone. Number three are power cards. These cards provide permanent buffs to your character and that stay until the end of combat. These cards are also removed from your deck after one use. Keep in mind, this does not count as an exhaust for exhaust-based cards. You play them once, they're gone. Th they do come back after combat, though. Inflame is a good example of this. Add 2 strength. All of your attacks now deal plus 2 damage. Number 4 are status cards. Status cards are given to you by enemies. They stay for the rest of combat unless you can somehow exhaust them. These cards are just useless. They're there to make your deck bigger so you can't draw the cards you want. Here are two different status cards. The one on the left is the slammed card, and it has the exhaust effect, which will remove it from your deck, but it costs one energy to play and get rid of it. However, on the right, we have the wound card. It cannot be exhausted, and it just stays in your deck. So, they're both there to be an inconvenience to you. Now, number five, we have curse cards. Here are the interesting ones. Unlike other cards, curses are only added to your deck through events in-game and are always negative. But you have to choose to take a curse. Now you may think, what Miles? Why would I ever take a curse if they're only bad for me? To which I would say, that's kind of a weird voice. Sorry. But also, if you take a curse, it's either to prevent something else that you can't afford to take, like damage, or you gain something in exchange for taking the curse. Maybe you'll get a curse, but you gain 200 gold. So it's risk versus reward. Is it worth it to take the curse? That's for you to decide. Try it out. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. It's all trial and error in this game. If this sounds like my advice is always, do it, see what happens, do it, just do it, just do it. It's because a lot of the fun that I had in this game was just trying out new things and seeing what worked. Should I take this curse? Probably not. But I'm going to try it anyway. Oh, it failed? Well, I probably shouldn't do that again. I, I don't want to just say, hey, do this and that's how you win. 100% win rate, slay the spider guy, uh, OP tactic, must watch. That's not fun. Well, maybe for some people that's fun. But if you want a guide on how to win, check something else because I'm not going to hand it to you. I'm not trying to be mean. But I think that the win is worth a lot more if you do it yourself through trial and error. You, you figure out what makes the game tick and what works. It'll definitely take a while. This game isn't easy for newcomers, especially if you haven't played something like Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh, which is all about building a deck and finding the cards that work together well and different combos that you can pull off. Like, oh, I can, I can use this card, and then after that I use this card, and then he takes double damage or something. On the subject of other card games, the combat in Slay the Spire is turn-based, just like those. However, unlike those card games, you always see what your enemy is going to do on the next turn. Because of this, you can change what you do to counter what the enemy will do, and it's up to you to plan your strategy around it. This really makes Slay the Spire unique, because I can see that the enemy is going to attack me for 10 damage. Well, okay, I'll put up 10 block and then attack him. That means I take no damage, and he takes damage. The other thing that makes Slay the Spire really unique is the relic system. On your journey, you may encounter a chest. If you open it, you have the opportunity to take a relic. Again, optional, just like the cards. These are trinkets that provide you with permanent bonuses in combat. They could give you more strength so you can hit harder, immunity to certain debuffs, more card draw, uh, maybe they'll give you Dexterity Boost, which raises the block you can gain. They could increase your health, they could increase your energy, they could upgrade cards for you, they could reduce the damage you take, they might even give you gold. Honestly, relics do so much that sometimes it's just best to adapt your strategy to around the relics you gain early on. 
Now, lastly, let's talk a bit about the characters. Just a heads up, I'm going to be diving a lot more into the mechanics of the game here. So if you don't understand, I'm sorry, you might need to watch a playthrough to actually understand. The first character is the Ironclad. I believe that this is a great starting point for anyone to who has just picked up the game. Because the, the character starts with 80 hit points and 99 gold. You start with a relic that heals you for 6 hit points after every combat. This allows you to make a few mistakes and not feel crushed by the difficulty of the game. Your starting hand includes 5 basic strikes, 4 basic blocks, and 1 bash card. The bash card is... okay? It's not bad, but I don't like that it costs 2 energy and it's a starting card, so you have to take it. The 2 turns of vulnerable is nice, so you can deal extra damage to the enemy, but overall I find it to be a pretty lackluster card. This is probably because I usually don't take the opportunity to upgrade my energy meter at all, so take my opinion with a grain of salt. The Ironclad usually specializes in dealing massive damage to enemies, either super quickly using cards like Strength, Bludgeon, and Flex, or dealing moderate damage to enemies and blocking as much as possible to preserve health. My favorite way to play this character is to try to remove as many as the basic blocks and bash as possible. So starting with bash, I remove it, then I re try to remove all my basic blocks, and then I try to grab as many clash cards as I can. These cards cost zero, and they do 14 damage. However, if I have any card in my hand that isn't an attack, I can't play the clash card, which means that any status cards, any curses, will disrupt the deck, so it's very risky to use. I also try to take a few metallicized cards, because then I just get permanent block, and then maybe double tap or something if I can find it. The second character that's in the game and I'll talk about is the Silent. This character starts off with 99 gold and 70 hit points. You also start with a Snake Ring Relic, which allows you to draw two extra cards on your first turn in combat. This is a great advantage, as sometimes those two extra cards can help you win one turn earlier, which will help you avoid extra damage that you would have taken if you had to wait an extra turn to finish the battle. Your starting deck consists of five basic strikes, five basic defends, one survivor card, and one neutralize card, which is one card bigger than the starting hand of the Ironclad. The starting deck has more cards, which can make it a bit more difficult to draw the cards you want, but overall I still like it. The high amounts of block you can get even early are incredible. I mean, technically in one turn you can get 18 block, wherein the Ironclad can only get 15. Now for the Silent, usually you run either Poison, which will whittle away the enemy's health slowly, while also running block at the same time to make sure you can stay alive. Or you decide to probably run Shivs, which are cards that cost zero, they do four damage, and they exhaust after use. Shiv cards are usually easy to use because the enemies can't just stop you from spamming Shivs. There are cards that allow you to draw extra Shivs at the start of your turn, or make the Shivs do extra damage, but I don't play the Silent very much just because it's not my playstyle, so I, I can't really give a, a, a solid opinion on this character. Now the third character of the game, and the last one for now, is the Defect. Oh boy, okay, strap yourselves in for this one. The Defect starts with 75 hit points and 99 gold, right in the center of the other two. The Defect's starting relic is called the Cracked Core. Now here's where things get complicated. The Defect has its own unique playstyle compared to the other two. See. It has the ability to channel these orbs, which have passive and active effects. When you channel your orb, it floats above your head in one of these orb slots. While it's in the slot, it will provide you with its passive effect. Every, if every orb slot is full, and you decide you want to channel another one, the rightmost orb will be evoked, and it will use its active effect, and then be removed from your orb slots. Then, all of your orbs will rotate clockwise, and the orb you just channeled will start in the leftmost slot. Make sense? If it doesn't, I don't blame you. It's kind of complicated. It's better if you can play it. Currently, there's four different orb types. One is lightning. It does three damage to the enemy at the end of your turn. 
It does 8 damage if it's evoked. It doesn't count as an attack, so any on-attack effects will not trigger. 2 is Frost. This gives you 2 block at the end of your turn. This is increased to 5 block if you can manage to evoke it. This is nice. I like pla I like I really like passive block because you it's just you sit there and you just get blocked for nothing. It's the same with the ironclad, why I like the metallicize card. On three you have dark orbs. These orbs do nothing but gain power while passive. They gain six damage per turn. When you evoke a dark orb, it does all of its damage instantly to the weakest enemy. So if you have a dark orb that's been sitting there for three turns, and you evoke it, it'll do 6 times 3, which is 18 damage to the weakest enemy. 4 is Plasma. These orbs give you 1 energy at the start of your turn, and if you evoke them during your turn, you gain an extra 2 energy instantly. You can pull off insane combos with these. Additionally, the defect has this extra mechanic called focus which will increase all of the numbers for your orbs by one except for plasma that's not affected at all because that much extra energy would be broken there really isn't a common strategy for this guy because he's pretty new but my recommendation is to uh, stack a bunch of channel cards and make sure to upgrade your basic zap so you can uh, get it for zero make sure to up your upgrade your dual cast as well because that'll cost zero as well. I would recommend channeling or getting a bunch of channel cards so you can cycle through them quickly and get all the evoke effects off. So you can get a bunch of damage, you can get a bunch of block, you can get a bunch of energy throughout your turns. Or what you could do is you could take a more standard play style and only take uh, the frost cards. So you stack those up and then you take also regular attacks. So you get a bunch of free block and then you also get to just attack the enemies in a more standard playstyle. There's a lot more of this game that I wish I could talk about, but sadly I can't review everything in this game, because that would make it over an hour, and it just wouldn't be as fun. If I reviewed everything, that would just spoil the game. So, I highly recommend checking this game out if you're even remotely interested in it. I think it is definitely worth your time and money. If you're unsure, I th suggest you should watch a trailer or watch a playthrough of it though, but don't watch too much because it may spoil the game for you, and it may take away that excitement and uh, and that that feeling of accomplishment when you finally defeat that one enemy or find a strategy to beat that guy who you're having so much trouble with. But as always, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you for the next video.